This is Dr. Howard Strassler with a Hints from Howard in Restorative Dentistry. Uh, today I'll be talking about restoration of the endodontically treated tooth. So, we have a real dilemma when we're restoring the endodontically treated tooth. Uh, the roots, root canals themselves, are irregular in shape. And think about it, the posts that we're using are cylindrical in cross-section, uh, but the canals aren't cylindrical. Most of the time they're ovoid or ribbon-shaped. Some of them have fins, and what we're looking at in these images are impressions of root canals uh, of uh, anterior and posterior teeth to demonstrate that the irregularities that are there. Certainly we instrument these canals, but once again we're using uh, o uh, uh, rounded instruments to create a form. Uh, so the instruments we use, whether it be to biomechanically instrument the canal or uh, to create post spaces, are dissimilar in shape to the canal anatomy itself. In fact, these anatomic irregular irregularities uh, really contribute as we get closer to the root ends, especially in premolars, molars, uh, a root thinness uh, that's very obvious in cross-section. In fact, thin tapering roots can predispose the canal uh, to perforations, as can uh, the fact that we have root concavities in different areas. So we have to really be very careful when we're shaping that dentin root complex uh, uh, when we're placing our gutta percha and then any considerations towards restoring these teeth. So using posts when restoring endodontically treated teeth, uh, why do we use posts? Well, the rationale for use is really to retain the core. If we have adequate preparation, adequate retention, there is no need for a post. In fact, most molars don't need a post. Many premolars don't need a post. Uh, anterior teeth, it depends upon how much tooth structure is missing, and certainly the type of post we select. So when we look at indications for post, when we do an access only to do endodontic treatment, we don't need a post at all, just a restoration of that access opening. For anterior teeth, where there's only a single class 3 restoration, once again, a composite resin adhesive composite is all we need. Uh, when there's tooth structure missing, a uh, significant tooth structure, we need to consider a post to, uh, to retain uh, the core. And the post type that we use is dependent upon the tooth position, the size of the tooth, the function on the tooth, the need for rigidity, which would be a metal post, or perhaps a flexible post, a fiber post. And then the other consideration is we don't want to over-instrument a canal, make the canal size larger to accommodate the post, but choose a post diameter that's suitable to the endodontically treated tooth without removing any additional dentin. So let's look at the choices for posts. Uh, the old standby was always the cast post and core with a, a higher low noble alloy. We can use prefabricated metal posts of a variety of different sizes and shapes and uh, in this clinical photograph to your right, you can see that this tooth has a metal head for retention of the core material. Uh, or we can use a fiber reinforced resin post, generally a translucent fiber post that will transmit light, not create any shadowing, and typically we're using fiber posts in anterior teeth and uh, premolars where may placing a metal post may interfere with the aesthetics. Uh, of the final uh, all ceramic restoration. So the challenges with a metal post when we select it is they're not bondable. The metal post can cast shadows within the tooth within a composite core on the facial root surface, cause a darkening. Uh, it may compromise the aesthetics of an all ceramic crown as the light transmits through the crown that will see the shadow of the core itself. But uh, the metal post has a rigidity. That rigidity may be beneficial to a tooth where there isn't significant tooth structure and we need the rigidity to retain the core and the final crown. But that same rigidity for an anterior tooth that's been previously traumatized and fractured why it needed root canal treatment in the first place, that metal post can put the root at risk for fracture. Uh, and we'll talk about fiber posts. 
So when we look at restoring endodontically treated teeth, we need to look at why do crowns fail uh, on these teeth. And in this case, if we take a look at this porcelain fused to metal crown, it barely extended onto tooth structure. In fact, there was no ferrule. And we look at a ferrule as 360 degrees around the tooth, hugging the tooth at the gingival margin. And there's been research looking at ferrules. So when we look, especially anterior teeth, at the type of load that's being generated off axis, that if we don't hold on to the tooth, onto the root surface, we're going to have some flexion, some movement, in fact, leakage, and we'll see a mechanism of failure. In fact, the ferrule height, the amount of extension beyond the tooth structure, uh, where the core meets the tooth, the cavo surface margin, that if we fatigue load a post and core, that we know we need at least a millimeter and a half to two millimeters of ferrule length of a crown preparation. When we see half a millimeter to one millimeter, we see a failure of that crown at a significantly lower number of cycles when compared to one and a half and two millimeter ferrules. So with adhesive restorative dentistry, uh, can we bond post within the tooth itself? Can we actually reinforce the root? And in fact, fiber posts give us that advantage of being able to provide root reinforcement with adhesive resin cements, as well as helping retain the core. In fact, uh, Nichols spoke about creating an engineering approach to rebuilding an endodontically treated tooth. In fact, he said the design should include a fail-safe system. When the failure occurs, it should be in the buildup and not the tooth. In fact, when rebuilding a tooth, maintain all the dentin that's available, even the thin slivers. These provide a strong connecting link between the core and the tooth root. And once again, this fail-safe system of the tooth fracturing uh, coronally and not within the root itself and the fiber post can do that. So let's look at the indications for fiber reinforced posts. We need at least a quarter of the coronal tooth structure remaining. If we have less than that, we're not going to do crown lengthening. We're going to have a compromised ferrule. We need a rigid post. We need to have the ability to develop at least a millimeter and a half ferrule on remaining tooth structure. That means an all ceramic crown preparation has to be on tooth, not have the margin of the crown end on where the fracture occurs, expecting the composite core will maintain the crown. Uh, the need for aesthetic translucency. If we need aesthetic translucency, we need a fiber post. And in high-stress anterior areas where impact absorption would be beneficial, once again, a fiber post, because of the fiber post fail-safe design, the post will fracture before the root. In fact, in our teenagers, young adults, who are putting their teeth at risk to trauma, uh, fiber posts make the most sense, and we'll see uh, a case where we did that. The critical area of post di diameter is at the CEJ. That's where we want the greatest uh, diameter of the post. And most posts have a tapered design, and so we don't want to over-instrument the canal, and we want to maintain at a minimum a half a millimeter seal. All post designs only need half of the root length for retention. So when we talk about a bonded fiber composite laminate post and core, the coronal seal will be with bonded restoratives. It'll create a uniting structure rather than a wedging structure where we'll be using uh, dentin bonding to create a composite resin monoblock structure. We're going to minimize aesthetic uh, failure, uh, minimize aesthetic failure by maximizing transmission of light through the post, through the root, through the composite, uh, eliminating that graying out phenomenon that we see with metal posts. Now let's take a look at, a, at a, a case, a patient who I saw in practice. A 12-year-old boy fractured his maxillary central incisor playing ice hockey. Uh, he was wearing uh, without wearing a protective mouth guard. And this tooth has been restored several times, nothing retaining the composite other than uh, the, the tooth structure itself. And it kept fracturing. He had the same behaviors. 
And so our decision was to place a fiber post. We minimized the risk when removing the gutta percha using a touch and heat from Kerr or a Gates Glidden. We don't want to over-instrument the canal. In fact, we're going to go back. The root canal itself is already adequately instrumented. We have enough dentin support. We're not going to make the post size fit the post. We're going to let our post size be dependent upon the gutta percha. And so we go in and we need to remove an additional two millimeters of gutta percha. But really key to any bondable resin cement is that if you look at the lateral sides of the canal, there's no gutta percha or residual cement there. And so I always take a radiograph after I prepare the root canal to make sure I've removed all the gutta percha and all the cement because composite resin against the uh, cement will not give us that adhesion that we want to the dentin. I use a, uh, a post drill merely to size the canal for what size post I'm going to select. And so I size this canal to the fiber post we're looking on the lower right hand side. I'm going to choose as my cement a type of composite resin, whether it be a self-cure, a dual-cure, or a self-adhesive composite cement. And I'll follow the manufacturer's directions as to how to use that cement and follow the manufacturer's directions as to how to use the fiber post. I'm going to prepare the canal, make sure it's dry. I'm going to place the cement within the canal. And when placing within the canal, I'm going to use a thin cannula tip either an Accudose needle tube from Centrix, or some of the cements themselves have thin cannulas that fit at the end. You can even cement these posts using uh, composite core materials that are dual cure. I then light cure. This is a dual cure resin cement. I light cure. The light's actually going to transmit through the, through the fiber post to the end of the post. And I've done research looking at that and looking at micro hardness. I complete the restoration with a nanohybrid composite resin to get an aesthetic result. And uh, since I was using a dental dam, you can see the dehydration effect. But we've got a fail-safe design with a fiber post. Or in another circumstance, here the patient had an endodontically treated tooth with no post and the crown failed. And this is what we're faced with. Uh, the plan is to do crown lengthening so we can develop that ferrule effect. Do a core buildup with a fiber post to retain the core and a ceramic crown. And when we develop this composite core, it's got to have an anti-rotational design. And so we go in and we remove the gutter percha using a touch and heat, using a Gates Glidden. And you can see this canal was rather large to start with. We're going to choose a post that meets the size of that canal without enlarging and removing additional dentin. We're doing our composite post and core before we do the crown lengthening. We'll do the crown lengthening once we have the provisional placed. With all fiber posts, when you're sizing them, use a diamond in order to get the size, the length uh, uh, in place. Don't use a fluted burr. A fluted burr will cause the glass fibers to actually shatter. I cement the post in place, and then I do my composite core using a dual cure composite core material that's tooth colored. Once I have the composite core built, uh, and you can see I've used some uh, gingival retraction core to control the, uh, the soft tissue, I then prepare the tooth for a crown preparation and do a provisional and, uh, and plan to do my crown lengthening. For this case, I was uh, I needed to do some bony uh, recontouring with my crown lengthening, not just soft tissue with a laser. Eight weeks after crown lengthening, I go in and I refine my preparation. And my preparation now has a ferrule effect on tooth structure, not on the composite. We've gained quite a bit of length when we did our crown lengthening. I make an impression and I fabricate a, a my crown and all ceramic crown and I complete my composite on the adjacent tooth. And I have a ferrule design that will contribute with success. Had I used a metal post, I would have had shine through of this composite core. But what if? 
what if the tooth does fracture, the post fractures? Well, when that happens, and for this case, that exactly is what happened, we cut the post flush to the tooth. You can see this post was cemented using uh, a core material. Uh, that's why it has a very opaque material, uh, color to it. I create a pilot hole in the middle of the post with a pin drill. I then remove the post with a Gates Glidden number four. I continue to remove the post with the largest nickel titanium rotary file that I have that matches the post size. I want to bring myself back to the uh, to the dentin within the canal. And in fact, uh, there is a C post uh, fiber post removal kit from Bisco. I go in with my Gates Glidden. Uh, after I've gone in with my Gates Glidden, I then go with, in with my uh, nickel titanium uh, files. And I'm measuring the length using my radiograph to create my new post space, to re-cement my post, and to uh, uh, redo the crown preparation that was there, and any additional uh, treatment that's necessary to get success. So after removal, uh, of the post. I resize the canal with another post. I cement the post. Or I might use a cast post and core or metal post with a pin for anti-rotation. But the key is can I restore with at least a one and a half to two millimeter long ferrule. So treatment planning. Fiber posts for aesthetics, root reinforcement, force dissipation, a fail-safe design, or metal posts when I need the rigidity because of the forces where I can't develop the ferrule, where aesthetics isn't a primary concern, and fort transmission's not a problem. I'm not worried about that fail-safe design, typically on pre-mowers. This was Dr. Howard Strassler with a Hints from Howard and Restorative Dentistry on restoration of the endodontically treated tooth.